Welcome to the Brain Gain Youngstown Leadership Series podcast. Each week, we'll learn from leaders who are driving change and making an impact. Now, here's your host, the CEO of the Youngstown Publishing Company, Jeff Leo Herman. We are here with Guy Coviello, the president and CEO of the Youngstown Warren Regional Chamber. Guy, thanks for having us in your office today. Uh, you're welcome, Jeff. It's, it's nice to have you here. No, I'm, we're thrilled. We've, we're, you know, we've known each other for a while here, and, and I, I kind of feel um, feeling sensitive, uh, or I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but I feel like you should be asking the questions, because you're, uh, <laughs> you, you literally have a, a strong background in journalism. You're, you're, you had a really long journalism career prior to your work here at the Chamber, and so... I feel like I'm, I have to be on point with my uh, questions. Well, no, you don't. But 30 okay. years as a journalist, all at the, uh, almost all at the Tribune and Warren. Um, and it is different being on the other side. And it, and it takes a little getting used to, but I'm used to it now. Uh, but it, it's, it's a lot of fun being on your side. Yeah, it is fun. It, you, can, you have a lot of degrees of freedom to operate, I guess, yep. right? Yep. So what, as a child growing up, did you aspire to be a journalist or... Did, I aspired to be a, a sports announcer, actually. Oh. Yeah, I, I, um, I was a big sports nut growing up. My family was, and that's where I got it. And, and my dream was always to be a, a sports announcer. The opportunity uh, came, though, no, to be a sports writer. And, and uh, I guess that was the second best thing in my mind, and I seized the opportunity. Uh, I, was, I became a sports writer while I was still in high school. Um, oh, Niles, in high school. Yeah, Niles had a daily newspaper back then, the Niles Daily Times. And so uh, I did some part-time work for them. And then while I was in college, the Tribune hired me as a part-time sports writer. And, and I was there for in that position for about five years. Wow. Did you have a knack for writing or a passion for writing? Or I did. It? Yeah, I enjoyed writing, not just sports, but predominantly sports. But yeah, I wrote a lot of little, as growing up, just a lot of little weird fictional things. Right. Yeah. Now, if you, if say you had that same, say where you were today, right at this present day, would that mean you'd have a YouTube channel today and your own you sports know, show? Yeah, that, and that was <laughs> one of the challenges too, you know, especially for the older generation to adapt to all the technology that has infiltrated the, the journalism world. Yes, but you're right. If I was going to keep up and modernize, then yes, there would be all the electronic platforms. Right. Did you have a favorite team? What 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 got you into sports? Was it just the spirit of competition the, and the agony know, of defeat. The family, my 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 older siblings and my my dad. I mean, they were all in the sports. It was always on TV, and so uh, and yeah, the, the the thrill of victory and the agony of there defeat. I can remember victory. that the yeah. skier wiping out. Yeah, you know, exactly. going down. Yeah, I, yep, I have vivid, wide world vivid uh, recollection of that on on Sundays, the wide world of sports. Um, and you mentioned favorite teams, and we were always Cleveland fans. Uh, so Browns, Steelers, I mean, sorry, Browns um, against the Steelers and uh, Indians and, and Cavs, yeah. And back then, when you were right on your beat, who, gee, Cleveland really never had a strong... Oh, no, the they did. Indians, they were, did. that was the 90s, All of them. right? All of them did. So, you know, when I was a sports writer in the 80s, the Browns um, were consecutive, uh, made consecutive appearances in the AFC Championship game. Um, the Cavs had their best record to date. Um, the Larry Nance, uh, Mark Price, oh, right. all those uh, guys, Brad Doherty. Um, and, and the Indians uh, were starting to come around, yeah. What did, what did you learn, you know, having basically, you know, our market is split 50-50 roughly between Cleveland and Pittsburgh. So was it different trying to cover Cleveland here in a split town? Um, certainly, certainly. Um, and but being in Warren, we were a little bit closer to, to Cleveland, and that was where the loyalties were a, a little bit more. Those loyalties also shift a little bit with who's doing well at the time. Uh, so you, you can see that you can see those kinds of things. Was there an athlete you you got to interview or you looked up to? On the interview side, Michael Jordan was one of my favorites. I would say um, until he made the shot, and, and then he wasn't my favorite yeah, anymore. Killed the Cavs. Um, but he was a he was a good one that comes to mind, yeah. So what, how did you progress at the at the Tribune? So, so you moved from sports into more 
managing editor, editor, right? Um, well, I went from sports to news writing. Um, and, and, you know, it was just a personal decision. When I graduated from college at Youngstown State, um, I just felt that it was, it was time to try something different. Um, and sports, um, although I was passionate about it, it, it's not the best lifestyle for a single guy. Right. All your work is at night. All your work is on the weekends. And, and for a really true sports fan, uh, being a sports journalist, journalist doesn't really work well because when you go to the games and you're watching your favorite teams, you can't cheer. After the game, you can't go out and, and, and have a good time because you're writing your story, you're doing your interviews and all that stuff. So it, 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 I just look forward to trying something different. So the, the topic of bias in journalism comes up quite a bit, especially these days. But are sports journalists allowed to be biased? Your sports is a whole different game. <laughs> so it's a whole, it is, okay. it's a whole different game and the style is different. You know, I always tell people it's easy for a sports writer to become a news writer. It's not easy for a news writer to become a sports writer. It's it's different, right? So what about what did you like about news writing or editing? Getting into uh, what was going on in the community and being able to make a difference in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a progression from being a, a news reporter to an editor, um, and then eventually the, the um, editorial page editor and writing editorials, uh, making decisions on content. Uh, taking positions on, on important matters, and then eventually the editor. But um, in those latter years, being able to have a positive influence on the community through the power of the pen uh, made that very appealing. Do you feel like the world, well, the, the obvious question, is the world different today? <laughs> I mean, the power of the pen, do you feel like the pen is powerful still or is social media just well, completely? Well, but I, I would still classify that as the pen. I mean, it's, it's yeah. still the power of journalism. It's, it's still just there. Everyone it's has a different one. platform, different format. They spill a lot of ink. Um, they spill a lot of ink, yeah. Well, that, I mean, that the role of individual opinion and, you know, served up on platforms that are geared towards enragement versus engagement. Yes, and so, the, yeah, we've always, in, in the print journalism world, considered ourselves journalists, and those in the broadcast journalism world we, we looked at as, enter, as entertainers or performers. Interesting. Or talent. Right. Um, and, and one of my favorite visuals of that, you know, I, I took a group of students to Atlanta and we visited CNN. And at the time, it's where CN, at CNN's uh, uh, broadcast area, the public gets uh, high up, like two two stories up over the yeah, newsroom. You can see down. See I've down. been in that tower okay. a yeah. lot. And the anchor, I, don't, I forget her name, this was way back, within an arm's reach, but you don't see it on TV, is a can of hairspray. Ah. And I remember telling the students, that's one thing you will never see in a print reporter's, <laughs> on a print reporter's desk, because right. it doesn't matter. It's all about the content, not about the, the, the presentation. The presentation. Yeah. But you're right. I, I think that there has been a lot of uh, migration over to creating rage and, and, and sharing opinion um, and, and a migration away from the objective news reporting um, on those platforms, mm -hmm. and I, I still think that, that the print product is, is still your more um, distilled, objective, straightforward right. uh, presentation of information. Well, it moves the community forward, right? So, so often the enragement algorithms just pit, pit people against each other versus a story shaped in a way as to drive, you know, based upon the community and, and the positive direction, then there are, you know, things that need to be exposed as well. But if you're focused on moving the community forward, which yeah, that's a lot of your work here at the Chamber. So how did you transition from a journalism career to your time here at the Chamber? Well, uh, I came here in 2014 as the Vice President of Government Affairs. And that was a role um, that I felt gave me an opportunity to have an even uh, bigger inf positive influence on the community. Um, it, it, it was one thing to be able to um, uh, present opinion and, and try to you know, sway and, and help people uh, go in the right direction. 
especially in communicating with, with our government leaders. But I thought at the time, and I and, and certainly was right, that from a position of being the VP of, of Government Affairs at a regional chamber of commerce, it's much more direct, um, much uh, more direct representation of the business community and direct communication and, and, and influence on public policy matters. And, and so that, that was a good move, I think, for a lot of us. Um, my predecessor had told me about his impending retirement. Um, Tom Humphreys was the president and CEO at the time, and he and I began talking about it, and, and we both agreed I would have a bigger, uh, more impactful influence in that position than the, the position I had. How important is governmental involvement at the you know, regional and state level? You know, so a lot of entrepreneurs have the opinion, whatever, just tell me the rules of the game and I'll make it happen. You know? That's, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely vital. Uh, public policy is, is absolutely vital if, if the community's going to be successful. You know, and, and I've heard it most of my life here um, in, in, ter in the way it's, it's been termed here in this community is, you know, we're always second fiddle to the three C's. Mm -hmm. You know, Cleveland, mm -hmm. Columbus, Cincinnati, get everything and, and we never get our fair share. Right. And they should get more than us, they're bigger. Um, it's a question of what's the fair share. Right. Uh, and I think that, that this organization has put a lot of emphasis in the last few years on making sure we get our fair share. Um, and so whether it's just direct dollars from our state and federal leaders down to this community or public policy that helps this community uh, prosper more economically or improve quality of life. Those decisions are made in Columbus and D.C. on a regular basis, and we need to be weighing in on what we want. Right. So, so for example, two weeks ago, the Cleveland Innovation District was formed. Uh, Cleveland, or a couple weeks ago, right? Cleveland Clinic and the University Hospitals. Okay. And then the Columbus Innovation District was just named recently. Cincinnati had an innovation district named in March of 2020, but obviously that got kind of squashed by the pandemic COVID, COVID or anymore. just buried, you know, by the pandemic. So do you see what I've been spending more time at the state level, especially on in the world of technology and innovation? Do you see, uh, do we need an innovation district or do we, it seems like we're doubling down on our strengths, right? Which is manufacturing and so we, we are doubling down on our strengths. We really need to do that. Whether or not it's an innovation district, um, I think that that's something that the community has to decide. Right. And certainly we would be well positioned to create that um, because we have a lot of innovation going on here. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, as a community, need to identify what are our opportunities, what do we need policy-wise? What do we need funding-wise to capitalize on those opportunities? And then speak collaboratively with one voice that this is it, uh, or these are the things that we need. Another C word, collaboration. Collaborate, you're not going to get anywhere without it. It's right. just absolutely necessary that uh, organizations in this community and the, and the leadership in this community, both business, community, and government, collaborate on what are our priorities and, and work together to go get those. So being, you know, you're new to the role, right? So congratulations on being named the president and CEO of the chamber. How, how will you move forward? Like what is your, what's the game plan, I guess, for? So certainly the game plan is, is that C word, collaboration. Right. Um, on, on the economic development side, there are lots of partners that need to collaborate better together all the way from Jobs Ohio in Columbus to Team Neo in Cleveland to all of our partners here, Western Reserve Port Authority, Eastgate Council of Governments, YBI, Bright Energy Innovators. I mean, we've got a lot of partners here that need to work better together um, and, and, and make it happen so that we can have more prosperity. So for everyone to have a seat at a table, we need a giant table. <laughs> well, it's, uh, <laughs> right. I guess that's one way to look at it. Um, but, but that's what works. That model works elsewhere. It needs to work here. Uh, no silos. Right. Um, we can identify and work together. And, and, and we've proven in the last few years what can happen when, when, when we do come together around our top issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it won't be that long now before we are the second, Youngstown's the second city in the state to have an autonomous shuttle. Right. Um, that took 
a lot of organizations coming together, speaking with one voice that this is important to us. And, and I don't want to be misleading about the, the shuttle because I think there's some uh, misconception that the shuttle itself is the end game. The shuttle itself is, is great. It would be nice to be able to park or if you live on a campus or you live downtown to be able to move about. But being no, only the second city, there's opportunity now f for that technology, for, for that convenience to develop, mm -hmm. for researchers and developers to want to be here, do the research, do the, get the analytics around how is this thing working and how can it be better and how can we improve it for the whole world, but let's do that here. Right, the shuttle you know, starts on the north side and runs through downtown, roughly speaking. But then all the news, like the news we publish every single day is all about Lordstown, right? And I'm, you know, spend a ton of time on LinkedIn. I hashtag everything Voltage Valley mm -hmm. and that flies, right? That content is wildly popular. So do you think the shuttle is like the first step and the answer to like is it bringing more R&D and what? Yeah, well, to the but, city? but I don't want, uh, you, you should spend a lot of time and a lot of energy focusing on what's happening in the Lordstown North Jackson uh, corridor there. Right. Um, and and, and it, the shuttle is actually somewhat of an extension. You know, it, it's an electric vehicle. Uh, it's an autonomous vehicle. And what's happening out there is sort of the, the beginnings of all of that on a much broader, more impactful scale. Um, that corridor is really a sign of, of an opportunity that we have to really blow it up. Mm -hmm. you know, we do not have to just uh, celebrate what we've accomplished out there. There's a lot more we can accomplish. There's a lot more prosperity we can uh, garner by focusing on why are those companies here and how do we attract more of them. Right. Um, and so when it comes to warehousing, uh, distribution, transportation, logistics, there's an opportunity here that's, that's gives us, I like to use this phrase, it gives us a sustainable competitive advantage over virtually every other city in the United States. And I, I think that there are four areas that this community has sustainable competitive advantages. And I think most communities would love to have one. Mm -hmm. And I think we have four. Wow. And, and that logistics is, is one of them. The, the development of private sector revenue generating use of electric, autonomous, connected mobility can happen here before anywhere else in the country. Around the country, you've got these uh, smart corridors where they're doing a lot of testing, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, work around transportation safety. How do you do autonomous mobility safely? Right. We have an opportunity to be the first one to actually do it for revenue generation for, for businesses, for job growth. Um, we need so a, we, we can need be a case study to other markets. We, other could, put, we could take what's, ha what's being tested and researched elsewhere and implement it here. Hmm. Let the private sector move product uh, through electric mobility, through connected mobility, autonomously. Let them come here and do it. And, and so, so I, logistics, elect Electric autonomous, uh, are there? I, I kind of group all that in, in one. Oh, okay. Uh, so all of that logistics is around migrating uh, away from, from, from uh, combustion engine to, to electric uh, uh, vehicles. It, but that's tied in with autonomous vehicles. It's tied in with having it all connected um, where everything's talking to each other. The, the vehicle, the, the, the infrastructure, the, the factory, they're all talking to each other. So that right. product can move efficiently. Absolutely. Do you, so thinking of, you know, there's, this is a pretty big agenda, right, and that we can execute. And I love how you said sustainable competitive advantage. What leadership style will you deploy here to, to drive the collaboration? You know, is it, and is it something that you've leaned on in the past or, you know, what you have an opportunity here, right, to just kind of put There is an opportunity, that, but, but the key is that it, it, it it's not here, it's not me, you know, it has to be us. Right. And, and, and that, that has to be the way some of the other leaders in this community view the opportunity. And I think that we've seen some leadership changes over the last few years, and, and I'm very excited about working with some of my counterparts at these other organizations that we need to be working with. And I think there's a, a hunger in this community for it to be about us. 
and I think, you know, if you go back far enough that there was too often this community that, that it was about me or it was about I. Um, but there's leadership in this community right now where you've, there's a lot of us using that mantra, this is about us. Right. Um, and, and so I think you'll see it over the next couple of years that, that you'll, and, and probably pretty quickly here, but it'll, it'll last a while. We're going to get some, some momentum and we're going to run with this thing, but it's going to be a group effort. Is there, is it, can you move the needle more quickly at, at, with statewide support or with, with national, with federal? I think both. And I think we've done that. You know, one of, the, one of the biggest successes I've had here, I think, so far is organizing those annual Columbus drive-ins and DC fly-ins. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that we recognized was happening in other communities that were competing against and wasn't happening here. And we wonder, okay, why, why are those other communities getting their fair share and we're not getting ours? And, and the fact was, we weren't down there speaking with one voice and, and, and sort of uh, giving support to our government officials that this is what we want, and if you do it, we've, we've got you covered. Mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna celebrate it. Um, so we, we, four years ago, started doing those, and those have had a big impact. You know, if you look at some of the accomplishments on the policy side, um, they were significant, and we didn't have those before, and we'll continue to do those. And, and they work well, you, you think about it, 75, 80 people all leaders from this community taking a day, mm -hmm. going down and meeting with the governor, the Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, uh, letting them know this is what's important to us. And then seeing those uh, pieces of legislation pass. Or, you know, we've had, consistently had 50 people take a day out of their schedule to go to D.C., actually two days, to go to D.C. and tell our congressional leadership and, and, and our administrative leaders that this is what we want back in the Valley and when you speak that way, they deliver. Right. No, I can provide a direct endorsement. The DC fly-in, that that was 2019, correct? The last time. Uh, last person. time we actually went there was 19, because 20 because of COVID. We did just, it virtually. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that that was an amazing experience. And you're right. If we, from a unified voice, showing our strength. You know, we're an iconic market. We're not going to take anyone's crap. <laughs> but I, no, I mean, sometimes you got to get a you little feisty. Know. And I yeah. think we're feisty, right? Yeah. I think respectfully. Respectfully aggressive, sure. Right, right. And, and that's the way the system was designed to work. The system was designed for the people to be able to go and say, this is what we want back home in our district. Right. But if we don't go and say it, that's not going to happen. Right, right. Yeah, there's just so many competing, you know. There's a lot of competing interests. And so we just have to go there and step up. And do you see going back to an in-person? April 14th. Oh, is Columbus? April 14th, we're gonna be in-person at the Sheraton on Capitol Square. That will be in-person, we'll be announcing that. Well, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll probably have already made the announcement. Okay. Um, but yeah, put it on your calendar, April 14th. Uh, the one difference this year probably is that we will not be chartering a bus to take everybody down because I'd I don't think anybody's going to be comfortable getting on a bus for three hours and sitting that close to each other. Right. So half of our audience drove themselves anyway. Right. Yeah. Doing other things. Yeah. You might do other things or come from different places. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, April 14th, we will have identified uh, probably three, at most four, major priorities that we want from our state leaders primarily in the next operating budget, which has to pass by June 30th. And so April 14th is not, you know, a magical date. It is very well thought out that that's the day, that's the time frame that we need to be down there when they'll be at the height of their discussions over the, over the operating budget. Um, and so whether it's in that operating budget or something that's become standalone and, and ongoing, and we don't, it's not April 14th and we're done. Right. So this organization and our partners will have all those follow-ups for for the following 12 months to make sure that what we are identifying as our priorities and conveying as a, as a group that there's follow-up to make sure that they deliver. Do you see, so what, what will be the big story? Is it building upon our kind of momentum it, around it is, logistics? It is. And so, yeah, so, well, let's go back to those uh, sustainable competitive advantages. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is military. Yep. Youngstown Air Reserve Station is one of our largest employers. It is Trumbull County's largest employer. Um, we have put, over the last five years, a significant um, investment as a community and as an organization on preserving that asset. 
over the last five years, the economic output of that air station has gone from $92 million to $137 million. And they now have more than 2,000 employees there. Mm -hmm. So we have been successful. This, this advocacy stuff, these, these trips to Columbus, that's resulted in significant state investment in that effort. So the state, this, in the current operating budget, has invested $600,000 directly into the Eastern Ohio Military Affairs Commission, which provides the federal advocacy to make sure the federal government continues to invest, uh, keep this uh, facility going, and, and grow. And the current investment in the, in, at, out at Yars is the gate, right? The gate sits right off the road. And so, so the gate's project. the latest. The gate's the, the current one that needs to be finished. Um, but over the years, there, was, there have been millions spent on the lodging facility. There's been, there was a $9 million firing range mm -hmm. that was built. Um, but, but the most exciting of all is that the current National Defense Authorization Act has about $350 million in it for four new airplanes. And now the battle is on to get those airplanes assigned to our Here. installation. And in that EOMAC, its director, Vito Abrazino, very successful at getting us positioned where we're one of only two facilities now under consideration. Oh, excellent. And, and the, a, a, a parallel effort now is in the next National Defense Authorization Act to get another 350 or 400 million for four more planes. Because we want eight here. Um, but all that, you know, is, is a matter of public policy and, and hammering away. The state's been very supportive. This community's been very supportive. There's a lot of opportunity there. So how much does the current administration at the U.S. level, right, Biden, how much does the current president have to do with those appropriations, or is this something that's worked through Congress? Both. They're both very influential. Is it's very the important. The change from, from Trump to Biden, is that... For this installation, I, I, I don't know that that's going to make a whole lot of difference. Um, we, have, we have an opportunity and an advantage, I think, because of our congressman and the committee he sits on mm -hmm. um, and his position on that committee. Um, we have had very good support from our senators, and we've even had very good support from uh, congressional uh, representatives outside of our district that see the value because the size of that installation means there's, there's, there are workers coming from outside of this district there um, and their supply chain outside of this district that supports that facility. So we've, we've been receiving very good support, but it's a massive bureaucracy when you're talking about DOD spending and, right. uh, and at that federal level. Yeah. The Brain Gain is a collaborative effort, and we'd like to thank our headlining sponsors, including Farmers National Bank, Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Mahoning Valley Manufacturers Coalition, and Southwoods Health. Also included are Eastern Gateway Community College, PNC Bank, the Moransky Companies, the Mahoning County Career and Technical Center, the Youngstown Business Incubator, Simon Roofing, the DeBartolo Corporation, Youngstown State University, and Junior Achievement of the Mahoning Valley. You know, we're going to switch gears here, uh, thinking about, you know, leadership, right? And, and we as a community have to come together and show leadership together to achieve our goals. Uh, thinking about leadership, we all learn from our mistakes. Have you had any leadership mistakes that you'd care to share? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are, um, especially at the newspaper, because mistakes in the media are very public and, and mm -hmm. hugely embarrassing, and you learn a lot from those. And I, I'm sure, I, I know there have been some, um, you know, everything from misspelling a name in a headline to, you know, having... Uh, a message that one employee sent to another appear in print accidentally, right. you know. And, and so a couple of those very embarrassing mistakes in, in my time have taught me a lot um, in, in terms of how to handle it, how to recover from it, just from a, you know, introspective 
look at, okay, how you, you gotta get up, you gotta face it. It's right. just, you can't run from it. it. You know, it's not a private mistake that you can hide from everybody who read the paper that they saw it. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of the, and, and one of the things that we did, we were very, very uh, uh, cognizant of is that there's going to be mistakes. We went overboard. Um, and I think it was a good thing that we did this in, in correcting mistakes and owning up to our mistakes. I mean, we devoted a little block of the page two every day to saying, hey, this is where it's going to be, and, and we'll own up to it. We want to own up to it. We want to be trusted. Right. And so we never shied from it. Right. Just taking it head on. Because I think have we to. trust we're human, is the so key we're going to make right. mistakes. Yeah. Right. And we all made, and is it, was it moving too fast? Was it... You know, sometimes you have to slow down, right, to right. speed up. That's right. And, you know, there's such a bias for action. That, you know, that's kind of an entrepreneurial characteristic is bias for action. Just go for it, you know, yep. kind of break some things. You know, in the world of Facebook, that doesn't work anymore. You know, they broke a lot. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I guess from, from our community standpoint, we probably, I think our pace is strong, right? So we don't really need to, do you feel like we need to slow down or speed up? Are we on track? I think we need to speed up. All right, I good. do, I do think we need to speed up. And again, I'm gonna go back to the four sustainable competitive advantages. Uh, logistics, mm -hmm. okay, and that's electric vehicles, that's that supply chain, that's connected uh, mobility, that's autonomous mobility. Uh, number two, the military. Okay, not just protecting and growing our air station, but helping our local companies enter that DOD supply chain. Mm -hmm. It's a vast supply chain, and there's lots of opportunities here. Additive manufacturing, um, a sustainable competitive advantage because America makes us here, it's nowhere else in the country. Um, and then those, uh, and then the fourth one is shale. And even though there's sort of a, a pause or a lull in that industry right now, we're still sitting in a great place to see lots of growth in energy, plastics, petrochemicals, all resulting from the shale play. So four sustainable competitive advantages that we have that virtually no other community has in each of these areas. They all kind of connect mm -hmm. in some fashion. So take additive manufacturing. Part of additive manufacturing is also adding connectivity in the manufacturing. So when that raw material is is being uh, created the factory already knows it's on the way the truck already knows when it's going to appear there to be loaded the, the shelf at the store already knows it's all yeah. connected rfid um, chips to take advantage of the iot right all internet of things yes yeah. and then you know at the additive process being used and having america makes help our local manufacturers because the scary thing is, we could go the other way. We could go the wrong way. If you, t if you look at uh, Lordstown Motors building electric vehicles, all team building batteries for electric vehicles, we have a lot of jobs here totally dependent on the combustion engine. Right. So every job we're gaining in Lordstown, if we're not careful, we can lose one or two jobs elsewhere. But additive can come along, help those companies bring that technology into their process so that they can diversify their product lines, become more competitive, and enter new markets. Um, and one of the markets that, that America makes is here, it, it, it has a mission to, to accomplish, is to help small and mid-sized manufacturers enter the Department of Defense supply chain. Right. So then you're back to military. So all of that kind of ties in together. Those four sustainable competitive advantages aren't in these individual silos. There's connecting points for all of them, and we need to really focus on those. And I think I do think we need to speed up a little bit in in taking advantage of the opportunities. Do you think we're positioned from a from a workforce development standpoint? So, 1,100 jobs at Ultium Cells. We have you know hundreds of jobs coming at Lordstown Motors. Yeah. You know, are we going to do we have a net? We're going to have a net inflow of population, or do you feel like we can fill those roles? Neither. Well, but I guess both, neither and both. I don't think any community in the country is prepared to, to, to provide an adequate workforce for its employers. Right. And, and for anybody, especially me, to sit here and say, we can solve that problem, that's no. 
but I do think that there's opportunity here through groupthink, through different organizations, um, and that has to include Youngstown State, Eastern Gateway, Kent Trumbull has to you know, include our career centers, has to include our ESCs so that we encompass all our K through 12, mm -hmm. uh, has to include our, our private uh, uh, organizations like PIA and, and, the, and so forth. I mean, we all need to figure this out together with the employers helping us, you know, paint the picture, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And then we, you know, we can, we can do a decent job of filling that, but we're a long way from really solving that one, but everybody is. Right. Every community in the country has that challenge right now. Right. What can we do to speed up? Are there things, you know, challenges you'd like to offer to our audience here or recommendations you'd like to make? What, you know? Yes, uh, you know, I, I do, it, and, and that is, being able to uh, put the ego aside, get out of your silo, um, and let's let's get together, and let's let's come up through groupthink. What? How are we going to accomplish the opportunities? How are we going to take advantage of the opportunities? How are we going to overcome the challenges that we have? Because there, let's not run from the fact that it's not all rosy opportunities. There's right. challenges that that we face that we have to overcome to get there. None of us are going to do it by ourselves, um, but together we'll, we'll, we'll accede to some of our parts. Is, is the challenge the conversion, say, from electric, you know, the leaving behind combustion-oriented businesses? That's part of it. You know, part of the challenge is, is this community lacks a, a um, sort of unified, um, I'll call it overlay, geographically of the two counties that kind of predetermines where does you, where do your utilities come from? Where does, where is the zoning the way it needs to be? And, and we're still somewhat at, at the local government letter, level a little bit parochial about those kinds of things. And, and so we run into some challenges. Um, we, we, we have to put an end to turf wars right. over those kinds of things so that our businesses and any business that we attract the day that they decide I want to put my factory here, it's already determined, okay, here's where your water's coming from, here's where you're sending your your, your waste. Here, we already have the zoning in place to meet your needs and the process if we don't to get to that point very quickly and, 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 and very cheaply. Do we have line of sight on solving towards that or is that still a work in progress? My challenge to the, to the audience. <laughs> Okay. Um, we, you guys, we all need to help. We all need to pitch in and figure out how do we solve that that overcome that that and other hurdles. Sure. We need to, we need to overcome the workforce hurdle. It's not good enough to say well everybody has that problem. All right, so they do, but let's be the one that finds the solution. Mm -hmm. So to close out, do you have a favorite leadership quote or something that uh, you look to to <laughs> in those couple, quiet times? There, yeah. there are a couple, both from Thomas Jefferson. And the one I don't mind sharing, and it goes back to my journalism days, and I, I'm not going to remember it exactly right now. Uh, but Thomas Jefferson said, said something like, if, if it uh, were up to him whether we have a, a government without newspapers or newspapers without government, he would not hesitate but to prefer the latter. Right. Um, and, and, I, and I firmly believe that still to this day. Um, the other one, probably not very politically correct to say it, uh, so, so uh, close to uh, what happened in, in D.C., but again, Thomas Jefferson said a, a little rebellion is is good now and then, or a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. Right. Um, and, and I and I believe that. I, I think that our government needs tested. Well, it's, and I and I view that as yeah, I, I agree. It's challenging the status quo. Yep. Right. So asking tough questions, getting everyone to kind of realize that hey, sometimes you got to shake things up. Yep. Right. Something. So there's nothing wrong with that. There. That's. To, to move forward, right, you have to embrace the ambiguity and embrace the difficult conversations at times, but you got to move ahead because you could just be... And it, and, and it can also reinforce the good thing that we have mm -hmm. and that it's worth protecting. So how do we get these four sustainable competitive advantages out to the world? Like, you know, we're in a kind of market and, you know, you hear, you, you, you know, you were in Texas recently you say to people, yeah, I'm from Youngstown. Do they give you like that sideways look like, oh, <laughs> cool. <laughs> you, get it, you get it mixed, sure. I, the, 
and I agree that the reputation is is not what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. And so again, you know, back to what are the challenges for the audience, and, and that would be to help us with that messaging. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what the platform is, what the format is. I think we need to, do, to create one. I think we need to come together and, and, and help with that branding. How do we want to be branded? Is it Voltage Valley? Is it the Tech Belt Corridor? I mean, it, you know, but let's, let's get around one and let's start doing what, what needs to be done so that those outside of this community look at us differently than they've looked at us in the past. Right. I don't even want to utter, utter the, the uh, RB words. Right, right. Uh, I just want to put that off out of our, out of our uh, language. No, I, I, it's funny, and, and this is organic, right? You just test things, look at the data, but you know, I referenced this before, Voltage Valley, you know, anytime I hashtag that, it flies. I have people from Tesla checking out our articles on Ultium Cells and Lordstown Motors consistently. So we, we're reaching a national audience through platforms like LinkedIn and, and other platforms. And even if there is an affiliation with Voltage Valley, even if you're not directly in the supply chain, so to speak, it's a brand. It's a it's something to embrace that's cool and unique and um, you know, still logistics, you know, electrifying your... Electrifying, sure. <laughs> so I think there's a lot to, to be said for playing with that. So, well, Guy, this has been really, really great to sit down and have this conversation. Learned a lot today. Any parting thoughts you'd have? You keep up the good work there. I think it's important for the business community to have a, a publication like yours to be the, the, the mouthpiece and, and to provide the information that we all need. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thanks, Will. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you soon, obviously, but definitely in Columbus on the 14th. Yes, yes, definitely Columbus <laughs> on the 14th. All right. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for joining us on the podcast today, because together we're building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development. So if you like what you heard, please share it with a friend. And leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast player. Your feedback is very important to us. We want to make the show better all the time. And if you would like to give me direct feedback, email me, please. My email is j-h-e-r-r-m-a-n-n -N at business-journal.com. Or you can find me on LinkedIn. And lastly, would love to thank the members of the Brain Gain Coalition. Those headline collaborators include Farmers National Bank, Sweeney Chevrolet Buick GMC, the Mahoney Valley Manufacturers Coalition, and Southwoods Health. And joining them are members of the coalition, including Eastern Gateway Community College, PNC Bank, the Moransky Companies, MCCTC, the Mahoney County Career and Technical Center, the Youngstown Business Incubator, Simon Roofing, the DeBartolo Corporation, Youngstown State University, and Junior Achievement of Mahoning Valley. Without them, none of this would be possible. So thanks again for joining us today. And remember, together we are building a culture of entrepreneurship and promoting workforce development. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell for notifications. And also make sure to connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. For all of your business news, visit businessjournaldaily.com. For all of your arts and entertainment news, go to afterhoursyoungstown.com.